grace be to you in peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dearly loved by God in Christ, if you were trapped in the bottom of a mine, or what many miners call the pit, or under a collapsed building, isn't one of the things we would do be cry out for help? Wouldn't we cry out in desperation in our situation, hoping that one who could help us and would want to help us would hear our cries? In a very real way, we cry out from the pit, from the rubble of our lives on account of our sins and their results uh, to someone who could and not will help us, but who has helped us. Our help is in the name of the Lord. It is out of the depths of our sins and the results of our sins and the, the messes we get into because of our sins that we cry out to the Lord. Some of the psalms are called penitential psalms, there are seven of them, that are good words that the psalmist himself used and under inspiration has shared with us. One of those penitential psalms is our text and our psalm for the day, Psalm 130. Our cries ascend from the depths to the Lord. And we see three things. First, his attentive ears hear my voice. And his forgiveness lifts up my heart. And finally, his word reaffirms my hope. We would not be wrong to equate the depths that the psalmist writes about with everything we face living in a fallen world. Often during my ministry, I use Psalm 130 in devotions with people who are in the pits, who are people lying under the rubble of their lives through no fault of their own, in hospitals, in financial troubles, in the midst of family circumstances that are not working out the way everybody hoped, in failing health, as I said, in adversity of all. It's from those depths that our cries ascend to the Lord. And they ascend to the Lord, and we cry out to the Lord because of that first thing I mentioned. We know that his attentive ears hear my voice. Now the psalm writer is using depth in a little bit more specific way that still applies to us and that is from under the depths of our guilt. The depths of our shame and our fear because of the sins that we have every day in our lives against the Ten Commandments. Think of the times, this maybe today, or this week, that you killed somebody with your hateful words. Or you bore false witness against somebody, not by telling lies or slandering them, but by sharing that little nugget of gossip, that juicy truth that would make them look bad or would make you look good. Or think of those times when you feared the future or didn't think God was going to take care of things the way that we would want him and thought that he would take care of them. What about all those minutes and hours that we spent in front of the television or in front of the computer wasting our time rather than being in the Word of God, reading His Holy Word revealed to us. 
Aren't these the pits? Aren't these the, the depths of our sins from which our cries ascend to the Lord? Out of the depths we just confessed our sins, our sins of habit and sins of choice that we have committed against God. But from the depths from which our cries ascend, at the top it's our Lord God. And his ears are attentive to the voice of our calling. God's attentive ears hear our confession that comes from a broken heart and a contrite heart side. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. What it is. The Lord has his ears, his attention turned to us. Think of the mother who is listening to the baby monitor. And you'd think she wasn't paying attention. You'd think she was busy off doing something else. But she always is listening. She always has her ear tuned to that monitor listening for any sound, particularly a sound of distress coming from that nursery. That's a beautiful picture for us that God is not wandering away off somewhere else, not paying attention to us, but he has his attention, his focus, his ear tuned to us and turned toward us. The Lord is like those first responders in a disaster who pour through rubble, listening. Remember back on 9-11, how they would go through and with listening devices they would listen and try to hear the cries of anyone buried under the towers. We have a model for that kind of dependence and crying out to the Lord and a motivator for that, our Lord Jesus. On the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane, our Lord Jesus, from the depths of his misery, cried out to his Father in heaven. And his Father heard him, and then he didn't hear him. A way for eternity. on the cross and Jesus the son knew that and said father why have you forsaken me what a horrific thing that God the father stopped being attentive to the cries of his son but he did that so that he would never do that to us that he would never not be attentive to us he would never not hear our cries for mercy because of what Jesus did. When you and I break the commandments, we know that Jesus kept them holy for us. When we know that we could not make any sacrifice to pay for our sins, we know that Jesus made the sacrifice that paid for those sins. And so we know that when out of the, from when out of the depths, our cries for arise they are heard and they are heeded by our Father in heaven and that's because of the forgiveness that we have in Christ and just as the Father's ears are attentive and hear my voice his forgiveness lifts up my heart you know sometimes in, in premarriage counseling, I ask people, what are the three most important words in marriage? And inevitably, someone will say, I love you. And I tell them, well, good guess, but that's wrong. It's, I forgive you. Those are the three most important words in any relationship. Are there any sweeter words that could come from our mouths to another then I forgive you. Because are there any sweeter words that have come from the mouth of God to us than I forgive you? 
The psalmist put it this way, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? That's one, one real good definition of forgiveness. Not keeping a record of sin. Not writing down, not making note of or marking every transgression of God's will. No, God has covered over, erased, and washed away any record of our disobedience to his holy will. He has done that by Jesus' blood. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean that God just forgot about, uh, for no reason, the times we have transgressed his holy will. God doesn't keep a record of sins because of that perfect life, that active obedience, remember from catechism, and that sacrifice, the passive obedience that Jesus offered on the cross. Remember last week we heard, lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors. Who can ascend his holy hill? Who can approach the Holy One? He who has pure hands and a clean heart, or clean hands and a pure heart. And we have that because of that forgiveness. That we the Lord's forgiveness in Christ of all of our sins powering. The words, I forgive you, are words that not only lift our hearts, but that lift up the hearts of one another. We use the same lack of record keeping with our spouses, with our children, with our parents, with our pastors, with our congregational members, with our employers and employees, whatever the relationship might be. Previous sins are not current weaponry. There are no sweeter words than I forgive you. Are there any more cutting or hurtful words than, oh yeah? Well, I remember the time when you did this or that. God never says, oh yeah? Well, I remember the time you committed this sin. You broke that command. I forgive you always. The Lord God, for Jesus' sake, hears our cries and forgives all our sins. He lifts our hearts up out of the depths. He has removed the weight of our guilt. He has removed and remitted all punishment for sin, which Jesus suffered. Now we know this. How? Because the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us in his word. The trapped, whether it or hell coming, when the rescuer cries out, I hear you. Help is coming. Don't give up. Have hope. We are going to deliver you. God's word has told us that God has delivered us. That's why there is the advent of his son, to deliver us. I was reading the paper the other day, a theologian now deceased. The headline was, God really wants to forgive you. And I thought, well, that's really not very good. God has already forgiven us. God has already in his word said, I have forgiven you all your sins. And that good news lifts our hearts and gives us hope. The word of hope for us is not, I will come to your rescue, hang on. It is, I have come to your rescue, hang on. Continue to live through the difficulties of this world. The psalmist writes those words familiar to us. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word 
I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. In the anguish of our sin, God comes to us in his word. And this is no false hope. This is real, genuine hope for us. It is the hope of the night watchman, of the, of the guard standing on the city wall all night long. And what's he waiting for? What's his hope? For the sun to come up so he can go home. So his long wait is over. And so you and I wait for the Lord. We watch for the Lord. We watch for him as he comes into Bethlehem to be our Savior. We watch for him as he comes into our hearts through word and sacrament. And we watch for him as we keep our eyes lifted to the heavens, waiting for him to come back. The trumpet sounds, the king of glory appears to give us hope. In the early verses of this psalm, the writer spoke in very personal terms each one of us may use. And then he closes with a collective appeal for the entire congregation of saints. O oh Israel, that's the church, O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And in that hope, and in that lifting of our hearts, and in that crying out to the Lord, to the ears, we pray, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, amen. Please stand.